Remember me? You know, so last year I talked about kind of this workshop I do and on entrepreneurship, innovation, self-discovery, and I talked about the work that we do uh, in consciousness. So uh, remember, there's hardware, software, what's the relationship between the mind and the body? And what we found is that the success of an entrepreneur or the management team of a company correlates to their level of consciousness. And what I mean by their level of consciousness is their ability to maintain presence. Right? So many people are thinking, but right now, as I'm talking to you, I see this little link thing. I see people are in. This is something Rebecca and I have been talking about for the last couple of days. She actually has a... No, no, I, you made me. You gave me a, a sleepless night. I thought. <laughs> <laughs> I just have to say, the second time we've done this, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Okay. <laughs> I am so sorry. But, I, first of all, what Gino does works 100%, all right? First off. And second of all, this is the second time in, in a year, basically, Gino did this, and I couldn't sleep. Not a single minute. But that's not the good thing. Well, that's because, and the reason why I'm fascinated, because I researched this area, and she has, you might be saying? Yeah, no. She has a, an interesting disorder, which is... <laughs> It's uh, actually not categorized as a disorder, but um, it's called low levels of latent inhibition. So essentially the stimuli that people um, receive um, is filtered. And for people with low levels of latent inhibition, in a way, their levels of being able to filter it and to funnel it are just sig significantly or less significantly decreased. Which, for my perspective and what I do in researching transformation and enlightenment, or for you Indian people here, non-dual awareness, you know, from a Vedanta perspective and everything, is we try to figure out we're about engineering enlightenment. And so how do you get people outside of thought and fully present here? You know, and if you look at Zen, you know, no thought, which is literally how do you take the energy of the physiology, what you generate, and then just be hyper aware of every little thing that's going on. So as I'm looking at you, the person walking out, and all the little things, being aware. So to be hyper aware of every little thing that's going on right now takes a lot of energy. And the more energy you have not tied to story in being able to maintain presence, clearly the more present I can be with my investor, my customer, uh, my employees, and my product, the more in flow and the more effective things are going to be. And so that's why it's important for entrepreneurs and management teams. To, and if you look at the industry today, you know now they're doing it kind of in a half-assed way, but they're saying, hey, in corporate now, the US, you have like mindfulness and meditation and all this other stuff. And it's there kind of to, and the whole purpose of it, if you look at it, the industry today, it's basically to make you a more, a more productive employee, you know, by meditating and everything. You know, the stress is so much, and how do you function with all the stress and the changes, etc. And so meditation and these kind of things help. But if you look at the traditions where that comes from, it's not really about that. It's about helping you self-discover. And so this workshop that I normally do, I'm on tour now, love to come back next year to maybe spend a couple more days, maybe do like a workshop here on entrepreneurship, innovation, self-discovery, is really looking at that. And that's uh, Entrepreneurship, Innovation, Self-Discovery. The tagline for it is entrepreneurship as a spiritual path. So whenever there's a passion or a desire, which is an emotion projected, working through a conditioned worldview, which is a person's belief system, with or against the unknown, there's an opportunity for transformation. And so what is, as you try to do things, what are the underlying emotions driving it? What are you doing? How is the reality responding, metaphysically speaking, and as things happen, how does that influence how you feel? And you'll notice certain things that you do flow fairly fluidly and effortless. Other things require, no matter how hard you try, it just doesn't seem to happen. Like, this today has come together fairly well, although I only have five minutes left, and I haven't even started my talk. <laughs> So the thing is, can you stay present and flow in this? And so that's what I talked about last year. This year, what I'm talking about, related to Rebecca's question too, is how do you get an organization to succeed? And so if you look at companies like Alibaba, and you look at these people, and if you look at the hardcore entrepreneurs, you know, they, when you're betting your house on your company, and you're going all in on something, and you win, 
you know, there's, a, there's an experiential learning thing that happens. You're literally going all in. And what happens is the management team, if you generally, if you talk to these entrepreneurs, they, and if you go to Davos, we're going to Davos tomorrow, a lot of these bankers, they're very present. They have a lot of energy, and they're just like, yes, you know, what can I do for you? And they literally, you know, come at you with all this energy. And the thing is, if you don't know, you're like, uh, you know, you're, you're going you're gonna to waver. But the thing about these companies is entrepreneurs, they succeed, they succeed, and then they get funding, and they have to grow big, and so their core team get it. But then they have to, and then they have to grow to like 5,000, 10,000 people in a year. And then the question is, how do you then get like 5,000, 10,000 people to have a similar mindset? Because they're all, everyone's at different levels of consciousness, different levels of perspective, etc. And the important thing to do when you do that is to engineer the culture of the company. And that's what this is about. And so to make companies more innovative, successful, internally, et cetera, improve communication, it's about engineering the culture of a company. And so this is, uh, so anyways, I do consciousness stuff. <laughs> and so cultures are created from the mythology, the art, and the rituals. And so the whole point behind this is that in the early days, your reality 5,000 years ago was dictated by whatever religious tradition you are. There you Indian guys are. <laughs> and then what happened was about, about, about 2,000 years ago, there was a split you know, with Aristotle, and then the material domain became science, and the mental domain became religion and culture. And if you look at religions and cultures, they're constructed from the mythology, the art, and the rituals. So if I take a religion, take any religion, Take any religion and remove, take a, pick a religion, remove the stories, mythology, remove the art, and remove the rituals, and what are you left with? Nothing. Right. So they're all constructed, and they then provide a common semantic reference for a group of people to communicate inner experience. If I say this is a white podium, you know what I mean. But if I say, hey man, I love you. What the fuck does that mean? <laughs> now, how do I know that my love means the same thing as your love? You know, my wife and I have this argument all the time. <laughs> and so, the challenge is how do you design a dynamic framework? How do you engineer in a company the company's mythology, the art, and the rituals that aligns the objective experience, i.e. the company performance, with the well-being of the employees? Right now, unfortunately, it seems like an inverse correlation. The better the company is doing, the worse the quality of life of the employees. Right? And so the question is how, for innovation and creativity, how do we align it so that the better the life of the quality of the life of the employees, the better the company does? Right? And that's really climbing high up the value chain. And it's really engineering the culture. And so to understand this and to understand what culture is about, it's really about <laughs> developing a common reality for people at different levels of consciousness to evolve. How do we communicate reality? How do we even communicate? How do we communicate inner experience? And how best do we support the people on their path towards personal development? And the key thing about this is that the only real difference there is between everyone is just their stage of development. And so this, I touched on it last year. Last year I had this slide, which is why I skipped over it. And this is, uh, you've heard, probably heard of, uh, you guys heard of Jean Piaget? He's like the father of child development. So if you have a kid, any of you have kids, so kids learn to like walk before they run. You know, there, there are certain stages of life where you kind of develop your worldview and the skills that you have. Language is at certain ages, etc. And it turns out there's another guy named Claire Graves that mapped out how people change their worldview as they live. And so this is this levels of existence theory. And the premise here is that if I ask you the decisions you make today, if you look 10 years ago, you probably would have made very different decisions. So the 10 years that you've lived have changed how you look at the world. And it happens for individuals, and it happens for countries as well too. So if you look at the United States today, and if you look at China, China's kind of where the US was in the 1800s with the Industrial Revolution. 
you know, the pollution, Beijing, child labor, you know, forced, you know, all of the kind of the way things are done, the massive tycoons and all this other stuff. That's kind of like the U.S. was in the 1800s. You know, the snake oil salesman, milk powder, you know, similar. <laughs> you know, it's just modern versions of, of but the, the zeitgeist and, and the attitude was that. If you look at Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia was kind of, is kind of, did I use that word wrong? I'm sorry. <laughs> you guys behind there. So Saudi Arabia is kind of where the U.S. was in the 1700s, right? If you think of the U.S. in the 1700s, the Puritans, the Salem witch trials, everyone's dressed like the Quakers and everything, you know, very religious, and, and, and you know, very, oh, you shouldn't do that, thou shalt not, you know, all of this other stuff, you know, if you look at the dollar bill, the, the Declaration of Independence, all this other, so the, the views are very different, and so as cultures shift, which are just groups of people, the attitude shift, and this represents this whole gradual transformation. And so what Claire Grave did was he kind of mapped this out as different <clears throat> levels. And so the interesting thing is that if you look at it, you know, this is the whole subject of another talk, but if you look at it, the learning system, the way of thinking, the motivational system, the specific motivation, the mean value, end value, nature of existence, and the problem of existence is mapped out. And it's different depending on where you're at and how you've developed. And really, it changes how you see the world, right? And as you develop, so if you look at it from here, if you look at <laughs> the debates in the United States, <laughs> like Donald Trump, well, <laughs> you guys know who this guy is, right? So you follow in the Republicans and, you know, the hardcore Tea Party people, you know, hey, it should be this, you know, women should be in... Well, we had a good woman's spirit. But women should be at home making, you know, babies, and you know, there's God, and you can't, you know, abortion should be illegal, and you know, gay rights should be gone. You know, so they have a certain worldview which is tied to a certain fundamentalist approach. Look, so the it's avoidant learning, absolutistic security, the specific motivations, order and meaning, the mean value is sacrifice, the end value is salvation, the nature of existence is saintly. And the ide ideal is to achieve everlasting peace of mind. And so that's kind of the Republican perspective. <laughs> and, the, <laughs> and if you look at the Democratic on the other side, way on the other side, the Bernie Sanders perspective, uh, the learning system is observational, the thinking is relativistic, the motivation system is affiliation, the specific motivation is love and affiliation, the mean values is so sociocentricity. The end values is community. The uh, nature of existence is uh, personalistic and is living within the human element. And so this is gay rights is fine. You just do. We're all in one team together. Let's save the environment. And this view is the green mean. This 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 slot here. The orange one between these two expectancy multiple. Multiplistic, independent, adequacy and competence, sentism, materialism, materialistic, conquering the physical world. That orange level is the entrepreneur. It's basically, I'm gonna go out there, I'm gonna discover, and I'm just, you know, you know, before this, they were here, they're like, fuck the rules. I'm gonna go off and do my own thing, I'm gonna challenge, I'm gonna discover, and I'm just gonna go make it and do it, right? And then usually after they succeed, or after a while, they're like, hey, wait, well, yeah, I've got these employees. About all this, and we got to do something about this, and then they go green, right? And, but there's a process, right? There's a process that people go through in developing through this. And I just wanted to show that level. And so, if you look at countries, you know, I mentioned the country example, but here are different countries, and you can look at where kind of they're at mapped out. And the whole planet, arguably, is in this area. And if you want to look at this, Claire Graves' theory of existence, um, Ken Wilber and Don Beck kind of bastardized it a bit and came up with this thing called spiral dynamics, which is based on the same stuff. Okay, so if you want to research this, I'm not going to go too much into it. And the whole point behind this is as you move up, it includes the lower levels. The lower levels still exist, but the center of identity changes. And the, what happens is, <laughs> the reason why you have so much conflict in the U.S. is the more complex levels tend to look down on lower levels, not recognizing their value and necessity, yet do not appreciate or understand the high level, higher levels themselves. Right? So, like, if you look at the Democrats, you know, 
you know, no, women should choose, right? You're stupid, you're, you're in the dark ages, whatever. And then the Republicans said, no, you don't know what you're talking. And so there's a, they're basically talking past each other using the same language because they're literally at different levels of existence <laughs> from a developmental perspective. And so if you look at it, actually Claire Briggs, when he mapped this out, has this tier one and tier two. And, the, and he actually talks about, Ken Wilber talks about, so the first tier thinks is what, the second tier sees the necessity of all the stages that are important for the overall spiral. Now, what they've identified is that the jump from the first tier to the second tier requires a momentous leap where a chasm of unbelievable depth and meaning is crossed. So most people hit green, and these green people, and then they hit, and then you know these people, I know these people, let's go do yoga, you know, let's eat vegan, let's be healthy and be with the environment. Oh, if you're not doing that, you're, you're evil. You know these people? <laughs> huh? Well, yeah, plastic waste and all this other stuff. But, you know, if you don't do that, you have to do this. And so they're, they're, they come at it with a fundamentalist perspective of this is the right thing. But for them to pop to the second level is very, very difficult. And the reason why it's difficult, and I've identified the reason why it's difficult, is because in order to jump, you have to acknowledge that there are bigger forces at work. It's not me, it's this. You know, up until then, the first level, it's like me, 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 achieving, doing, doing, achieving, achieving, etc. And it's about me driving. But to make that jump, you have to let go of the me. You have to go, it's not me. How does all this happen? I don't know. There must be bigger forces at work. Right? And that's very difficult for people that are kind of me-driven. Right? And that's why the jump is incredibly difficult. And so the idea here is that knowing this and knowing that people go through different stages in development, as a, some, a CEO or a management team, then the question is how do I design a culture for a company that accommodates to all these people and helps shift them along the path of their own personal development, right? And we've lost that. And so if you look, and so this is a company I, I, I actually ran, good friends with Tony Shea, hard to get him out here, too cold for him. <laughs> but, uh, but he has this company called Zappos, he had a company before that, uh, Link Exchange that sold for 300 million, this one sold for 300 million, does fairly well, prides himself in the corporate culture. And if you read the news, and I read it and I was kind of inspired, is he had his corporate culture, they define these core values. And what happened last year, do you guys know what happened last year? No. He said, forget all of this. I can't innovate anymore. I'm going to a process called holacracy. So he moved from top-down management to holacracy. And you know what? 15% of his workers quit. Probably the 15% that were in management. <laughs> Because there's no more management structure anymore. And then what happened was chaos for a while. And it's still chaos, kind of, because there is no, in, in holacracy, I'll just show you real quick. In holacracy, there is no top down term. It's all circles and it's committees and everything, which is kind of a tier two management structure. So when I saw that, I'm like, yeah, man, you're going for it. You know, they're like the biggest company, 15,000 employees, you know, just jumping off and doing this. Literally jumping off a cliff. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> and so what happened was their core values was deliver wow through service. Great. Embrace and drive change. Create fun and a little weirdness. So be different. Be adventurous, creative, and open-minded. Pursue growth and learning. Build open and honest relationships with communication. Build a positive team and family spirit. Do more with less, <laughs> be passionate and determined, and be humble. So these are their core values. This is their mythology. So if you look at festivals like Burning Man that have their 10 rules, this is their core, core rules that define what this company is about. And so what happened was I went and looked at them, and I hung out with them for a while, and I actually delivered six two-hour workshops in two days, which was <laughs> a lot of stuff. But their culture is individual focused, 
towards groups and collective consciousness, which is the classic green meme. And the hilarious thing is I'm going through Claire, I went to deliver these workshops and I asked them if they knew about Claire Graves and you know what, they talk about being a teal organization, which is a tier two company. And I asked them, do you know what teal means? They're like, yeah, it's a color. I'm like, no, but what it means related to country. I'm like, no. And I'm like, what? You don't know what teal means? <laughs> and you're going into holacracy? Oh my God. <laughs> And so there's a lot of, uh, anyways, so <laughs> they basically went, and then basically the classic green, accepting cultural diversity, but it doesn't, they don't understand the levels of consciousness, which is why there's a lot of conflict, you know, nutrition, etc. And the thing about them is if you look at their, their values, they're based upon personal achievement. So it's, you know, do more with less, strive to learn, etc. improve yourself, which is like a classic orange. But then they're about the team and all this other stuff. So they hover between orange and green. And then when you go there, which I went, and I went for drinks, they're all like sugar drinks in their environment in terms of the design of the, the culture and the, the, the art and the rituals. And then what it's about when you're there with their people, they do shots. It's like, hey, let's go drinking later on or you know, let's just do shots. And so they're like a work hard, play hard. It's like college. <laughs> right? Work hard, play hard, and it's that kind of ethos that drives them. And the issue is that this is still tier one between orange and green, and it doesn't really prepare, promote a tier two jump, or really acknowledge the bigger forces at work. Right? And so what I did, and they're still looking at it, but what I did very quickly is realizing this fundamental change, is I revised their ten core values. And so I changed it, the wow of now. This moment is a miracle. Right? <laughs> Think of the 14.7 billion years of evolution that brought us to this moment, right now. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Health first. Listen to your body, your heart, and your gut. Right? Health first. Listen to yourself. Listen to your body. The natural intelligence of the physiology. Live authentically. Act from your deepest truth. Don't worry about it. What do you really feel as deep as you can? Know why you are here. Without you, we wouldn't be who we are. <coughs> Honor every moment with your fullest potential. <laughs> potential. Apply yourself in every situation. Bring it. Every conflict is an opportunity for personal growth. We're all on the same team. Embrace and accept change. Learn to forgive and adopt. How can I make this better? There's always something to improve. Every decision, every action is an open question to the universe. You have one view, I have one view. Is it going to happen? I don't know. Let's ask the universe. Let's decide and then see what happens with objective measures. Every decision is a question. Flow, imagination and action work with the reality rather than against it. And so these arguably are more tier two values that consider the bigger forces at work. And so the premise is that if you then shift your values and your mythology, the culture shifts. And so part of it is the mythology, but then the part of this too is recognizing turbulence and you know when there is conflict, you know why isn't this flowing? And really looking at it in a, from an Eastern perspective, <laughs> Eastern perspective, the outer reflects the inner. And so what? Why is this happening the way it is? And what's my role in this? And what? How are my beliefs, and what are the forces driving this within me? And so using the process of work and business and success as a vehicle for exploring who I am and how and why are things happening this way, right? My own development. So using the development of the company as a, a way of developing myself. So engineering experiences, self-aware support. And so the question then is designing the mythology, the art, and the rituals. And the idea here is to understand the, the myth, psychology, physiology. You guys are great here. I was in Zurich, you know, the Jung Institute, understanding archetypes, understanding the hero's journey, the monomyth. And as you understand, understanding health. And as we understand this, can we then apply this to design and craft a culture? Just like George Lucas took the monomyth and Joseph Campbell's work to design Star Wars as an archetypal story. Can we take what we understand about transformation, about personal development, about psychology, about symbols and mythology, 
to engineer a culture for a within a company of a company to facilitate transformation. Now, the exciting thing about this is the working consciousness is that there's a convergence now with what we know about neuroscience and what we know about video games and interactive media. We can learn a lot about. We know that when you're very anxious and anxiety, your heart rate variability changes. You know, so autonomic nervous system activation correlates to heart rate variability. So can we then create, use these new technological products in the corporate environment to facilitate as part of the art and the rituals in an organization? So this is a simple demo of something you could look at. Imagine HR using this. But what happens is two people sit in chairs, and what it does is it measures your heartbeat. And then what happens is the person sitting here can feel this person's heartbeat. And the person here can feel this person's heartbeat. And so imagine HR trying to fire somebody. <laughs> and then, but the idea is here we're using technology to facilitate greater intersubjective engagement. How do I connect the people together with tech? And then now with heart rate variability, imagine a conference room where I've got the heart rate variability of all of the people in the meeting, and I've got you know, the lights or the environment is changing based upon how all the people are feeling. Or imagine if everybody is wearing something hard or it's built into their chair, the CEO can literally see the wellness status of all of the employees in the company. So that's what we're moving towards as a potential for engineering new culture within organizations. And so the organization is there, you're still working and doing things, but it's a collective inquiry into the unknown. And so that's the premise and that's what we're looking at for the future of, of, of ritualists, you know, looking at what we know about video games and gamification. This I like to show, I had a boss not you, she used to be my boss. But I had a boss before that whenever I went into a meeting, and this is coming from me, who's like way over time, talked too much. And every time I went into a meeting, he just like literally lectured me. And so what I did once to a meeting is I brought a chess clock. I said, okay, we're gonna have this meeting. When I speak, I'm gonna press this. When you speak, you press that. And we had an objective measure that he could literally see how he was just taking up all the time in the conversation. But if you then brought tools like this, you know, into the environment and then design this. The idea is, again, what Rebecca said, how do you get an organization to be more effective, right? And so arguably in the early days, religion was what dictated what reality is. Today, it's the corporate environment that dictates what the reality is. You know, if you don't do this, you're not getting paid. <laughs> and so how, as future business people and people establishing companies, how then do we engineer environments and experiences that facilitate, that take care of our employees and really help nurture their own development? Because we're all in this together. Ultimately, the whole planet, we're in this, but as a company, as a core team, we're in this together. And the better you are, the better we are. And if we come with that mentality in this, then you know, that's where innovation is going to happen and people are really going to apply themselves. All right? Yeah.